Uh, this morning's speaker uh, is a Spring Arbor grad, and this week, both this Monday's chapel and Friday's chapel, we have a, a Spring Arbor grad who is speaking. Um, today, Sarah Cunningham, uh, who is an English major, and she is a secondary education major as well, and she has three other minors, and she probably won't talk about those, but that just tells you kind of what her, um, uh, how intellectual she is, and maybe how she just has a lot of interest in, in making a difference in the world. Um, she's written books like uh, Dear Church, uh, Donkey in the Living Room, uh, Well-Balanced World Changer, and um, a number of other books, I think seven in total, is that right? Both children's books and adult books, right? Um, but we're just excited for her to come and share with us. Right now she works with a ministry helping um, be ad an advocate for the persecuted church in over 60 countries around the world. And so she's going to come and share her story and some of the stories of the church around the world. And we're going to pray for her in between worship and her speaking. Um, but I just want to uh, make note of our prayer banners that we have on either side of the altar. Um, in Hebrews, the book that we're studying this year, over and over again, the author is making the case that, that Jesus Christ is our intercessor and that we can boldly approach the throne because of the work that he has done on the cross and the, re the power of the resurrection is the power that works in us and works through us in prayer. And so as we continue to emphasize prayer as our prayer team um, each day, each time we gather here for chapel, they're, they pray through this space. They are then available up front to pray with you. Um, during worship, if you want to pray, there'll be a couple of people over by the banners if you want to go there to pray. Or if you just want to come to the altar and pray because you have needs on your heart and you feel uh, uh, led to pray, the altar is open during worship for that. And we will also have folks available after the message to pray as well. And I know... Um, having a number of emails in my email, my inbox, I know that many of you have concerns, either for yourself or for family or for friends. And so please take advantage of this time that we can gather together and approach the throne boldly. So let's use this verse from Hebrews as our call to worship. Would you stand with me? Let's read this together. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. So we're going to enter to a time where the speaker and we're going to have them pray. So if you would like to join us and pray for the speaker and lay hands on her. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you, God, for this day, God. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing here on this campus, God. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would order our steps this week, God, that we would have an awesome week, and Lord, that you would continue to show us more of your glory and more about who you are, God. And Lord, we just thank you for the speaker, God. Sarah, we ask God that you would anoint her words, God. We ask God that she would, God, have so much peace, Lord, that she would, God, be encouraged, and Lord, that she would bring forth, God, your word in spirit and truth, God. And Lord, I just thank you that every heart and every mind will be open to what you are saying, what you are doing. And God, we just thank you for a spiritual freedom over this campus, God. And Lord, we just, we just ask God that you would have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Freshman Gibbs, room 107. Uh, it was the first day of freshman biology class, and the professor, his name was Joe Jaworski at the time. And he was giving one of those kind of first day life-changing lectures on the syllabus and how to use the lab equipment, right? So he's telling us all of these safety tips, like when you're using these little knives, I think they call them scalpels, and you're you're cutting through these animal specimens, you want to make short, precise cuts so you don't cut yourself. And if you have to make like a long, forceful cut, well, then you should, you should cut away from yourself. And he shares like maybe 900 more of these safety tips, and I'm looking around at the people around me thinking, if anyone needs this much information at this point, they really are not ready for college. Maybe they should go home, come back again in a couple of years. But eventually, Mr. Jaworski, he says, all right, class, it's time. I want you to go ahead and take out your knives or open the box. And I want you to open the microscope that's sitting in front of you. It's brand new. It's factory sealed. And so my biology partner, Chuck, carefully takes a knife out of the scalpel box and he then um, very gently moves over to the microscope box and with the precision and carefulness of a rhinoceros on cocaine he stabs it into the box rips it through the factory seal off the edge and through his other hand blood is everywhere so I'm like going over to the paper towel dispenser, you know, that long brown paper towel, I'm wadding it up and holding it on there, trying to get the bleeding to stop. And then I did the only thing I could do for this man to ensure that this human being got everything he needed. I married him. Because <laughs> somebody's got to keep this joker alive. Yeah. But actually, this story is a little misleading because how many of you are in biology class right now? Raise your hand. Okay. So it kind of implies that you might just look around and find the one, like right there, right? You're like all thinking, like, who's my biology lab partner, right? But it wasn't actually that simple. I met my husband the first day I was here at Spring Arbor. That was 23 years ago. But I didn't actually date him until after I had graduated. In fact, uh, my road to marrying him was a little hard. I dated this other guy on campus. He was a really solid human being, no complaints, but I did not know what I was doing. And a couple years in, I was in too deep, and I could see that if I kept going the way that I was going, I was not going to live the life that God had for me. And I walked away, and it was really hard. And I was angry at myself because I almost feel like, what business did I have, like dabbling in romance? I clearly didn't know what I was doing. I was burned. And so I uh, came up with a carefully crafted plan to never get hurt in the dating world again, and that is to stop dating. And I'm sure some of you can relate to that, right? You get to that point. And so for a couple of years, perfectly great guys on this campus would call me up and ask me out, and I was like the queen of the instant no. It was like, hey, do you want to go to a movie? No. Dinner? No. Hello, Sarah? No. <laughs> I was a total buzzkill, right? Um, but, so then I'm graduated. I'm working at a church here in the community at the time, and I walk out the hall after a service, and in comes Mr. Biology Lab Hazard himself. And he comes up to me in the hallway, and ladies, he laid a trap. He said to me, Hey, good to see you. We should get together sometime. We should get together sometime. I'm thinking, yeah, we were in core group with Dan Vanderhill, actually, together. Yeah. We were history minors. We were both in education. We were both RAs. We know each other really well. Yeah, we'll get some coffee. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it. A couple days go by, and I begin to get tipped off that we are not going for coffee because I pick up the phone one day, and it's him. It's Chuck, and he says to me, hey, just wanted to check, where do you want me to pick you up? And I was like, no, 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 no. When you go to coffee, you go in your own car, you go to the coffee shop, you pay for your own coffee, you get back in your car, and you go home. Like, I knew that this question, where do you want me to pick you up, was going the wrong direction. But what do you do at that point? I mean, you've known the guy for like five years, so I go out with him. 
and that was over 18 years ago and is the last first date I've ever been on. Yeah. But unless I set you up for failure, I want to tell you that even though it was hard and heartbreaking to get to that point, there was plenty of hardship and heartbreak after that point too. And I want to tell you a little bit about it because um, life isn't pain-free, not when you're here, not when you go forward. A couple of examples of some of the hardship we've encountered. We moved into an urban neighborhood and there were four kids who lived across the street from us and we loved them. And they were growing up right in front of our eyes. And two of them died before they were 21, and a third is in prison right now for committing a really serious crime. Combined, my husband and I have taught 27 years of high school in the Jackson area schools, and we have buried more kids to gun violence than we could even tell you their names. Sometimes we even saw it coming. We tried to steer the trajectory away from that, but it didn't happen, because sometimes life is harder than you expect. On September 11th, you've probably learned the towers hit, um, or the planes hit the towers at Ground Zero in New York, and I was able to lead a trip of 45 people from Jackson County there to help with the relief work. And I sat on the midnight shift at night, and I looked these New York Fire Department uh, firefighters and policemen in the eyes as they told me how they, their friends, their colleagues, their partners had gone into the building as first responders right before it fell. And they had been digging through the rubble for days and they were just coming to the grips that there were not gonna be any more survivors found. I was working there at the makeshift morgue at the base of those towers and I saw some things I'll never unsee because life is harder than you expect. And probably the hardest moment that's ever, no, definitely the hardest moment that's ever come to Chuck and I is that when our youngest son, Malachi, was three years old, we found him after a household accident. And he was cold and lifeless and not breathing, and his body was blue. And you guys, I thought he was dead. And I cried out to God. And I breathed into his mouth all the CPR that they teach you. And he came back. And we took him to U of M, and he's a healthy, 100% functioning seven-year-old today. But you can tell, even though it's been four years, it's hard for me to talk about because life is sometimes harder than you expect. And I wanted to say that, not to bum you out, but to say that I know a lot of you, like me, you grew up on abbreviated versions of the Bible stories, right? The ones they tell you in Sunday school that are sanitized. They have the hardships kind of stripped out of them. And it just sounds like David, he just had to throw one stone and boom, Goliath down. Daniel, he just refused to stop praying. And then the lions didn't touch him. And Moses, he just waved his staff and the Red Sea opened up and then it crashed down on his enemies. And it can be kind of misleading because we could start to expect that our experience is gonna be the same way, always, that it'll be pain-free, and that it'll be a heroic series of victory after victory, and that's just not the case. Sometimes it's harder than you expect. And the good news is this, the passage that Brian Kono gave to me, today's theme, it gets at that. But I wanna start by asking, how many of you have taken Greek here at Spring Arbor? How many, okay. I read that it takes 1,100 hours to master Greek. I mean, you throw on like Aramaic and that's like half your life, right? Well, I, as he said, was an English major. So what I do is I download the Strong's Concordance on my phone. It takes like eight seconds, just saying. Um, I only bring that up to say that the word house in this passage, when you hear the word house as an American, you're probably thinking like brick structure, wooden frame. But in this case, it's not a literal structure. It also can mean a figurative or a metaphoric structure, something, a place where someone dwells. So here's the verse. Moses was faithful in a serv as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. That passage is about how life is hard. 
It actually deals with Christian persecution, which is ironic because that's the thing that I now spend my life fighting around the world. And this passage reminds me of the words of Jesus in John 16:33, and these are the three things that I'd like to drive home today. In this world, number one, you will have tribulation. But number two, be people of good cheer, because number three, Jesus has overcome the world. Dear God, I pray that you would do in this moment what you want to do for each of these people, for me, for everyone here. Stir in us the things that draw us close to you and make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a Monday, February 13th. It was broad daylight in the suburbs. And this man, a very sweet man, 62 years old, his name was Raymond Coe. He was known for having a big heart. Every morning he would wake up and he would make oatmeal for his three children. And every Valentine's Day, he would bring his wife a dozen red roses. He suffered from cancer, but it didn't stop him from running a community center that worked with single mothers and HIV and AIDS patients and drug addicts. And sometimes he'd even show up at home shirtless. And when his family asked him about it, they would learn that he had run into a homeless person and he had given them the shirt off his back. So Raymond, it's an ordinary day. He's getting into his silver Honda Accord. You can see it there. And he's on the highway that he travels all the time, hundreds if not thousands of times he's headed to work, when suddenly a black SUV screeches up in front of him, cuts him off. And I'm guessing he was pumping the brakes and kind of like, whoa, come on, pay attention, buddy. But then another black SUV comes up, and it comes roaring up to right back against his bumper, uncomfortably close. And now he's stuck between the two cars, not knowing what to do, and a third black SUV, unbelievably, comes and traps him in. And the three of these vehicles begin to work together to drive him off the road until he has no choice but to come to a complete stop. There were two surveillance cameras that were watching this. And we know from them that there was a struggle and that Raymond Coe's, his Honda Accord, it lurched forward and it hit something. And then there was the sound of breaking glass. And then five men who were in hoods and black masks and black clothing from head to toe came and yanked Raymond Coe out of his car and they threw him in an SUV and they slammed the door. And 40 seconds from the time this started till they ended, they sped away and the only thing left of Raymond Coe was the broken glass from his car and the license plate from his vehicle that was teetering on the pavement. You might ask yourself, what was this? Like, coordinated activity that happened? Was this like some high level of intelligence going after a foreign spy? No. The reason that Raymond Coe was abducted was for a very ordinary reason. And it's a reason that applies to me. And he was abducted for a reason that applies to most of you. He was abducted, rooted out, hunted down, because he was living out his faith in Malaysia, which is a region of the world that's hostile to Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, he's not the only one. As the Senior Director of Communications at Open Doors USA, reports cross my desk every day of Christians who are harassed, assaulted, excommunicated from their village, People, spouses leave them. Governments take children away from their mothers forever because they choose to follow Jesus. We work with people who are raped, who are unjustly imprisoned, who are kidnapped and even killed because they refuse to renounce Jesus in more than 60 places around the world. If you ever go to our website at opendoorsusa.org, you'll see that this is the top 50 places where it's most difficult to be a Christian, and we do this research and release it every year. But here's the good news. The passage from Hebrews that we just read is written for this exact situation because it was written to first century Christians. If you remember, they, of course, were expecting a Messiah that was going to come in and overthrow the foreign rulers who had been oppressing them in their minds. But instead, of course, Jesus just overthrew ideas. And they watched as their leader was rooted out and hunted down and arrested and nailed to a cross. And then the followers dispersed. And you remember, a lot of them were afraid. And this group of the first generation of believers were considering going back to the old ways of the Jewish law. And now the Hebrews author is writing to them to encourage them 
as they face hardship, and I think maybe by extension to encourage us. So back to this verse, the author is building a case from history to encourage these people. Think about Moses. Moses was born in a time of mass infant murder, right? The Egyptians are worried that the Israelites are going to multiply at such a rate that one day they'll overthrow them. And so Moses's mother is put in a really bad spot. She has to scoop up her baby and put him in a basket, a baby refugee, and throw him into the river, desperately hoping that maybe some good will come from it. And of course, you know that the royal family picks him up and he's raised as an Egyptian, only he's torn because he's part Hebrew, and as he looks around at the injustice and inequality in society, his Hebrew people are being beaten and whipped as slaves by the Egyptian power holders. And one day he goes up to this man who is beating a Hebrew, and he tries to intervene. And when he does that, he ends up killing the slaveholder. And as a result, now he has to flee as a fugitive. So yeah, the verse is right. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. He, of course, goes on to say those famous words, let my people go. But he was no stranger to hardship. He knew persecution, because in this world, you will have tribulation. Now think about Jesus. Jesus was actually born in a different time, again, mass infant murder. He's born, and Herod is worried that the Messiah is going to raise up and overthrow him, so Herod takes the same tactic, and he starts to kill these baby boys, several years old. It's this desperate effort to hunt out the Messiah and Joseph and Mary have to take Jesus, and they too have to flee as refugees, ironically, to Egypt. And then Jesus comes back, right, and he starts teaching and preaching and healing, and he's rejected. He's harassed by religious leaders. He's hunted down, arrested. They put a crown of thorns on his head, a sign that says, King of the Jews, to mock him. They spit on him. Jesus, as the verse says, is faithful as the son over God's house. But he was no stranger to hardship. He knew persecution, because in this world, you will have tribulation. And now he's building off these two examples. The author, he turns to the first century Christians, the ones who are facing persecution. And he says, now Moses, he's the servant of his house, right? And Christ, he's faithful as the son over the house. But you, you and I, Spring Arbor, we are his house. Just think about it. Moses lived under the law, right? He lived at a time where you had to make sacrifices to be in relationship with God. And then you have Jesus who comes first century and people have this representative of God, but not everyone meets him. Some people do, some people don't. But now, now he's talking to people who came after Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, right? And John 1 tells us that now God dwells in us. So what he's saying is we aren't just members of his house anymore. We are his house. And this is where the hope lies. Because what does it mean if God dwells in you? It means your body is the living, breathing house of God. It means that where you go, God goes. And if you go to someone, you carry God to them. And in every step and in every breath that God is with us, Emmanuel, present in all things, that God's on the move in and through us. To steal the words of Paul in Romans 8.31, whoops, If God is for us, or I might say, if God is with us, if God is in us, if he is dwelling in us, if you're the living, breathing house of God, if the creator, the sender and resurrector of Jesus is dwelling in you, then who can be against you? And if no one can stand against us, because no one can stand against God dwelling in us, then how can we not walk around this planet as people of good cheer? One of my friends at Open Doors, Pete, he says it this way. He says, if the son of the living God is working in you, notify your face. Because really, if we believe that Jesus is dwelling inside us, we should be lit from within. How many of you, when you graduate, want to go out and impact the world for good? Yeah, and I believe you will. And when you do... Some people are going to call you this word. They're going to say you're an idealist. And it's a good word for some of us because we picture the world the way it is and we know that there are some things that are flawed and broken and they need fixed and improved and we long for more kingdom to come to this world. We long for the world as the way it can be. Okay, we're idealists. But I also want to tell you something. Some people are going to use these exact same traits in you, your hope, 
to try and dismiss you. You're gonna pitch ideas and projects. You're gonna take up causes. You're gonna believe that God is on the move inside of you and through you and that he is gonna make new solutions and miracles possible in your day. And some people are at least metaphorically gonna pat you on the head. And they're gonna say, isn't that sweet that he still walks around with his head in the clouds like that, that she still wears these rose-colored glasses, that somehow in the face of historic evil that's unchanged through time and these systemic, overpowering global issues, that person, isn't it adorable? They still think they might be able to make a dent. And hear me on this spring arbor. When they dismiss your hope this way and in other subtle ways, don't you listen. Don't you listen? Because what you're feeling right now before you go out and you graduate, that, that desire to do big, bold things that bring more of God's kingdom to this world, that is the right response to evil and suffering. And it's a shame, you guys. It's a shame when people, especially God's people, grow out of thinking this way over time. Because what do we say we believe? You know what, this is not idealism we're talking about. What do we say we believe? We say we believe God sent his only son, Jesus. Let him die on a cross, send him to the grave, but the grave couldn't hold him. And three days later, Jesus rises up out of that grave and he turns over the laws of, of life and death. He upside downs this world and he sends a message to all humankind that you no longer have to fear the thing that most humans fear most. Because in Jesus, death has no sting. And if you're living out of that truth, if you really believe what you say you believe, if you really believe that the living God is dwelling in you, that he's on the move in you and through you, that God might actually care about this world enough to do something now, to be able and willing to do something about it today, that is not idealism, that is called faith. And shame on anybody who can't recognize that. Don't you dare bow to critics who have stopped acting like the living God dwells in them. And don't cower to people who've forgotten what it's like to actually believe what we all say we believe. Because the world needs you. Persecuted Christians like Raymond Coe, they're among the people who need you. Jesus said the world can't afford for the salt to lose its saltiness. They can't afford for the light to be under the bowl. I'll add that the world cannot afford for the houses of the living God to forget who's dwelling inside of them. I will promise you this. God did not start dwelling in humans so that we could remain neutral. God's living in you. Please don't bore him. Take him on an adventure. And you'll be people of good cheer. You'll be the people that we're waiting for. I want to introduce you to a guy named Brother Andrew. He's the founder of the organization where I work. And in 1955, he started visiting the European bloc countries where communism was on the rise. And it, there were a lot of restrictions happening at this time. They were regulating how people could get together, or if they could, to worship God. They were banning scriptures. They were making Bibles illegal. Uh, worthy of being imprisoned. And uh, this man, I think some people might have looked at everything that was happening, at the uprising of communism, the clashes of these world powers, the militaries that were being mobilized to make sure that their way advanced. And some people would have said, oh, that's a huge systemic, historic evil. It's a too big of an abuse. No one's ever going to make a dent. But Andrew, he believed what we say we believe. He believed that God was on the move in him. And so he determined in his heart that he, one man, was going to start taking Bibles load after load after load in this Volkswagen Beetle. One particular day, he came up to a dicey checkpoint in a communist country. It was a border, and there was a booth, and it was manned by armed soldiers. And he's in a line of cars, and his, his car is full of Bibles that are contraband, that are illegal, that could get him arrested or worse. And he's watching, hoping that the guards today won't be paying attention and they'll just rush everyone through. But he sees to his dismay that the first car there, the first guard, the guy says, everybody out of the car. And he gets the occupants out and then he makes them take all the contents out of the car and lay them on the ground. And then the soldiers walk by and inspect everything those people had. And Andrew says, Lord, what am I gonna do? And then he looks at the second car and the same exact things happen, take everything out, third car, take everything out. The fourth car gets worse. 
As the soldier is inspecting the contents, something triggers his suspicion, so he goes and gets some tools, and he starts removing the hubcaps of the vehicle in front of Andrew. He goes in and he unhinges the seats from inside the car and pulls them out, and he carefully goes over that vehicle with a fine-tooth comb, looking for anything that shouldn't be going into the country. Andrew, as you can imagine, his anxiety is rising. And he's thinking to himself, where can I put these Bibles? What's the best place for me to put them in the lowest chance of being discovered, like under the seat or in the trunk? And finally, he just realizes this is so far beyond me. And he says a really cool prayer. He says, God, I know that in the New Testament, Jesus came and he touched blind men and he made blind eyes see. Today, God, I'm asking you for the exact opposite. Can you touch this seeing man? and make seeing eyes blind. And he drove up to this checkpoint and he handed the guard his paper and he pulled the handle to get out of his car and the handle wouldn't budge because the guard's leg was up against the door holding it closed and the guard did this. And Andrew said he wasn't sure what that meant. He thought in faith he hit the gas and he started going a little bit and he's watching in the rear view mirror thinking maybe the guards are gonna call out and be like, no, we wanna inspect your car. But instead, what Andrew sees is the car behind him. They're telling those people to get out and lay all of the contents of their car on the ground. In the face of hardship, at the risk of his life, Andrew did something only a crazy idealist or a person who really believed what we say we believe, who thought the living God was inside of them would do. And he gets through not just once, not just twice, but over and over and over again. He took Bibles many, many trips to Poland, East Germany, Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia, Albania, Cuba, Russia, China. And in 1975, he went on this show with Pat Robertson, the 700 Club host, and he looked at Andrew and he said, Andrew, your face has been all over TV now. You'll never be able to smuggle, bu smuggle Bibles again. And Andrew looked at him and said, that's what you think. Because Andrew had faith. In fact, his faith led him to the Middle East many, many times. In fact, last year, Andrew was 90 years old, and he went back to the Middle East. And when he goes, he is the craziest idealist you've ever seen. He goes up, and he knocks on the doors of Hamas. He walks in to these major terrorist training camps that are used by the Taliban and by Al-Qaeda. He's completely uninvited, unannounced, no warning, and he just walks up to the tent like he owns the place. And he knocks and he says, can I see your boss? And they always bring him out somebody to talk to. And then he stands there, this frail, kind of silver-haired person of good cheer. And he smiles and he says, good morning, brother. I'm here because God has given me a message for you. And they let him in the tent. And time after time, Andrew has gone in and talked to militant extremists about how Jesus died on the cross and rose again because God loves them and wants relationship with them. And he leaves them with as many Bibles as they're willing to take. And do you know how many times he's been told no when he does this? Zero. No one has ever told him no. Andrew's a person of good cheer, and the world needs more people like that. My last point, I said, Jesus has overcome the world. I want to draw your attention to Matthew 16. This is really important because this is the first time anyone, anywhere in the Bible uses the word church. And you probably know it. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I just want to point out to you that Jesus, when he's saying this word for the first time and he's telling them what's coming, I have a feeling he knows what they're going to see in their lifetime. I have a feeling he can look into the future. He can say, there's going to be times where it looks like the world is so full of evil and suffering that you won't be able to make a dent on it, in it. The church will be wiped out. You might fear that it's, we're coming to an end, that this hope we believe in, it's not going to go forward. And so Jesus says in the very first breath, when he tells them, hey, by the way, I'm going to make this church, and also, just so you know, the gates of hell, the forces of evil are not going to prevail against it. Today, Brother Andrew's work has spread. We have 24 bases around the world. We work with staff and partners in 70 countries. This last year alone, we delivered 2 million Bibles and pieces of Christian and discipleship material to people in 70 of the most vulnerable and closed and hard to reach places around the world, some of them to the underground church, just like Andrew did. 
We also have helped 900,000 people in the last year rebuild their homes after ISIS, find trauma uh, counseling after being kidnapped by Boko Haram, and other things like that. But I'm here to tell you, Spring Arbor, if my persecuted Christian friends were here today, they'd tell you this too, the church is still alive and well. And it's just as true today as the day where Jesus said it, the church is built on a rock and evil is never gonna prevail against it. I'm not gonna close by giving an altar call because I don't think you should give your life to the persecuted church. I don't think you should give it to my pet cause and I don't think you should give it to the pet cause of anyone who ever takes this stage. Don't give your life to your professors. Don't give it to this institution. Don't give it to the Spring Arbor concept. Give your life to Jesus. Go out and tune into what God's doing in you. Whatever he's stirring bright white hot in your spirit, be obedient and bring that to expression. Seek to make your highest contribution in allegiance to the living God who dwells in you because God is living inside of you. And it's time for you to take him on a bold adventure. Not for my sake, I'm gonna ask you to do something. Please take out your phones. I know you have them with you. Take out your phones for me as we close. Not for me, but for the 245 million Christians who are experiencing risk around this world. I'm gonna ask you to go to the app store or you can scan that QR code right there. And there's an app called Pray for the Persecuted. And I had the chance to work with the team when we developed this app last year that will take prayer requests right from people like Raymond Coe's family and send it to your phone three or four times a week. And all you have to do is take a couple of seconds. It might only be 15 seconds. Will you download for that, that for me, please? 15 seconds, a few times a week, and you can press pray and it will tally on the back end. And what will happen is when we go and I see Raymond Coe's family again, I'll be able to show them, hey, when you gave us that prayer request, 1,400 people in the United States prayed, prayed for you. Because what happens is these believers start to feel abandoned and isolated and alone. Their whole government, the militants, there's lots of different forces are against them. And it starts to feel like God himself might not remember that they're there. And sometimes it's being able to show them that people care, that people are standing with them, that not only does God remember them, but there are Christians around the free world who are aware they're there, who as we fight against causes like racism or poverty and the other things that I know you will fight against, I pray that you will consider making Christian persecution one of the areas in your life that you keep on your radar over the course of your ministry. And right now I'm gonna take my phone as I close and I'm gonna make a quick video so I can show it to Raymond Coe's family next time I see them. I'm gonna ask you if you're willing to pray using that app. Will you stand for me, please? Because I wanna be able to tell Raymond Coe's family and others just like him that there's this little town in Michigan where I used to go to college and they'll probably never hear of it and they'll probably never come and they probably don't want to because there's a lot of construction on M60 right now. <laughs> but that there are people here who are praying for them. There are people here who are gonna go out in the world and be some of the world's best educators and businessmen and social workers and who knows where else God will take you who will remember them and pray for them. I'm gonna pray for you as you go. Dear God, in the words of my former chaplain, Ron Capico, who's here, modified words, I pray that you will let these people go and give everything they can for you. I pray that they will give all the time and all the money and all the energy that they can so that at the end of the night when their head hits the pillow or at the end of their life when they look back that they will know they gave their lives for something that matters. I pray that the time they spend here at Spring Arbor, that it will, it will capitalize, it will multiply what they would have done in this world. Instead of reaching or helping 100 people, that they'll help thousands. In the name of Jesus, be with them, show them favor. Amen. Congrats.